if you are a member here at Ohachi, then the way the Bible speaks about that is that you are a part of and involved in all of those things, that all the fruit that comes from those ministries, as well as those who serve here as ministers, that all the fruit that comes from those things are your fruit. That fruit is counted to you, to use the biblical terminology, particularly if you're, uh, if you're giving to those things as well. And so we're very thankful for this church and all this church is doing. Uh, thankful for you and your involvement. And um, that is some of the things that we are doing this year. And, and there's some more that we're planning on doing this coming year, which we're excited about. Uh, if you saw any of those ministries you want to be a part of in a more substantial way, just come talk to me and I'll send you to the right person. Parents Night Out, by the way, is this week, right, Kayla? This Thursday, 530 to 830, free babysitting. So bring your kids or your husband and go take a nap and uh, go on a date and have a good time. Uh, we, we obviously have a lot of young families, which we're very thankful for. And we want to make sure those marriages are healthy. And this is something small we can do to help in that regard. If you are a visitor here, then you have found yourself here today in the middle of a, a bit of an un, unordinary series for us. Normally, the way we do things is we open the book of the Bible and we move through that Bible through the year. Last year, we went through 1 Timothy and 1 John. And we'll start that again in just a few weeks. But to begin the year, we are focusing on a topic that we feel like we have opportunity to grow in, an area to grow. And that's the, uh, the area of the way we view the local church, or to use the $5 word, the area of ecclesiology, the way we think about the church. Last time we were together, we defined church as this, a physical body of believers committed to the Lord and to each other for the sake of God's glory and his bride's growth. Christianity, unavoidably, is not an individual religion in a way that many modern people think of it. It's just kind of about you and Jesus. It's never that way in the Bible. Christianity is unavoidably communal. The bride of Christ isn't you. It's us. The body of Christ isn't you. It is us. We said last time that the church is God's plan for expanding his kingdom. That's clear biblically. The thing that will grow into a mountain that will fill the earth against which the gates of hell shall not prevail, is indeed God's church. Ephesians 3, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the world. 1 Timothy 3, that the church is a pillar and support of God's truth. More crucially for our time today, we said last time, the church is God's plan for your growth. We're still in January, and some of you, if you're faithful, have made it three weeks on your New Year's resolution. You're doing quite well. If you're a Christian, then almost all Christians at the beginning of each year have some sort of resolution like, I would like to grow spiritually this year, whatever that looks like. God's plan for you to do that is very clear. Chiefly, it is through the church that you are a part of, through the people of God that you assemble alongside. We looked at all these passages, and this is not all of them by any means, but all these times in the New Testament where Paul or other New Testament writers say to do these things for one another, often called the one another passages, that you are called, in fact, obligated as a Christian to do these things for each other, to encourage each other, teach each other, hold each other accountable, uh, be hospitable towards each other, pray for each other, confess sins to one another, all these things. And we focused on the reality, the biblical reality, that if you're a Christian, you are obligated to Christians in a way that you're not obligated to non-Christians. It is good for you, for instance, to pray for everyone. But you are particularly obligated to pray for Christians, for those that are your brothers and sisters in Christ. So at the end of 1 John, saw it in Jesus' prayer in John 17. And we asked, what if it was true in 2024 that there was one person, three people, 200 people who had committed to do these things for you? who had committed to encourage you when you were down, to show hospitality to you, to pray for you, to uh, hold you accountable for sin, to comfort you, to work with you together for the gospel. It would be very difficult for you not to grow if that was the, if that was the case. It'd be very difficult for you not to love Jesus in December more than you love him today. This is what the church is meant to be. We cannot read the New Testament and come away thinking that listening to a sermon and singing, which I have an extremely high view of both of those things. But we can't come away thinking that those things are the sum total of what church is supposed to be for us. This cannot be separated from that. This is what we're called to as a church. Sometimes I wonder if the modern frequency and seriousness of many problems that Christians face in America um, largely personal problems, mental problems, depression, loneliness, anxiety, marital problems, is because Christians aren't experiencing church like this, the way that God has called us to in this relationship with each other, to walk alongside each other as we walk after Christ. I know 
there's a little bit of, of, of toe stepping here, but know that I'm stepping on my own toes as well. Errol and I have, have made changes this year, are doing so in, in hopes of doing these things better because relationships where these things happen don't just happen. Relationships where these things can happen don't just happen. We have to, as Christians, give inconvenient effort to building relationships with each other. Maybe that looks like showing up early and staying late for church. Maybe it looks like going to a class or going Wednesday nights or coming to a life group, all of which are phenomenal relationship opportunities, maybe the best thing about them. Or maybe to invite people to your home or to have coffee together. But to make inconvenient decisions for the sake of the gospel and the bride of Christ. In a culture, if we're, if we're all willing to acknowledge this, in a culture that sets personal convenience basically at the top of the ladder. That sets personal convenience as the highest thing. We are called to relationships that are very often inconvenient. There is, there is clearly in the Bible a cost to discipleship. It's one of the things Jesus talks about first when people come. It's not, hey, if you'll come, things will go well. It's, it's going to cost you something. And the cost is not just that the world's going to hate you at times. It's also that you have been called to inconvenient relationships with often difficult people like me. This, this is crucial. If you hear nothing else, church is not just yet another place in modern America for us to play the role of the consumer. Just coming to get mine, spending the service, judging the singing and the preaching and seeing if it's worthy of my expensive consumering time. It's a place for us, sons and daughters of the king, to love God and love others, which by definition means to sacrifice your convenience and sacrifice the things that are often what we want to do. Which brings us to a topic that has changed here a bit without ever having been explicitly taught on. If you're a Christian, you are obligated to these things. You have been called to them. You have commanded to these things for Christians. But... There's only 24 hours in a day. And you don't have the ability to do all these things for all Christians everywhere, or even all Christians in your town. So to whom are these things primarily aimed at? The main answer is this, I think, biblically. Your fellow church members. Those who are members of the same assembling body alongside you. Every letter in the New Testament was written to churches about Largely, how to treat each other in your church. When all these commands were given in these letters and read publicly aloud in front of those congregations, Paul or the other writers have in mind those who are listening to the letter right now along with you. The commands aren't, all these commands aren't forgive other Christians, though you should do that. No, it's more specific than that. The commands are forgive one another. Those of you together listening to this letter, forgive one another. Show hospitality to one another. There is mutualness to the command. Hebrews 10, 24, an example of one of the one another verses. says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good deeds. Now, are you called to stir up one another to all Christians in the world? Maybe to some extent. That's not what he's saying here. He is saying, stir up one another to love and good deeds. Then he says, the next verse, to make it clear, verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. It is those you are meeting together with that you are particularly called to. It is those that you are members alongside that you are particularly called to in all of these one another areas. One anotherness assumes connection, assumes at the least physically being with this is one of the reasons why virtual church or online church is an oxymoron. One, one scholar said, a virtual church, church is about as useful as a virtual spouse. And that's often the language we get in scripture. That we are called to each other in a very familial way. And just like online family is not going to do you a whole lot of good. The same thing is true of, of the new modern idea of virtual church, which again doesn't even make sense definitionally. So, what I have today is a position to talk about that hasn't been necessary to defend in Christianity until quite recently, historically, and that is this. Church membership, being a member of a church, is biblical. Now, there's not one simple verse here, but this sort of official connection to a local body is assumed from Matthew through Revelation. 
this being called to each other in this way for each other's mutual encouragement and spiritual growth and loving Christ more in this official way is assumed. Here's the simple, short case that I'm going to make in the next few minutes this morning. There are commands given throughout the New Testament that don't make sense if there's not church membership. If there aren't people who are assigned to a local body and submitted to those leaders. First one is this. Christian leaders are made responsible for specific sheep. Christian leaders are made responsible for specific sheep. For instance, Acts chapter 20. To the overseers, to the elders, to the pastors, to the shepherds, all the same group. It says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. We have three elders here currently. Who are those men called to look after in this way? All Christians everywhere? Of course not. It's to the flock that they have been given. The necessary question is, how are they to know who that flock is? There's not some way of saying, these are mine and these are not mine. Surely just whoever walks in the door on a given week is not what we're talking about. First Peter 5, shepherd the flock of God to the elders that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge. The elders here have been given charge, First Peter 5 language, have been given charge of a group of Christians. They have not been given charge of all Christians. They have not been given charge of everyone who walks through the front door. They have been given charge of a particular group of Christians, what we call the members of this church. Hebrews 13 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Listen to this, all of you who, who especially think you may want to be a leader or a teacher or an elder one day. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account to God about the leadership. The elders of this church, the leaders of this church, will give an account to God about how they led those that God gave them. So who, who will Greg Tangersley give an account for? All Christians everywhere? Everyone in his life? Certainly not. He will give an account for those that God placed here as members of this body underneath his shepherding, pastoral care. How can leaders know who they're responsible for without membership? Secondly, Christians are responsible to submit to specific leaders. So the reverse of the first. Christians are responsible to submit to specific leaders. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Or the same verse we just read. Obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over you, <coughs> over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Who are you told to obey as a Christian? All Christian leaders everywhere? Of course not. But the Christian leaders here to whom you are accountable. The Christian leaders here who will have to give an account for your soul to God. It is to those leaders that you as a Christian are accountable. Surely we must know who our leaders are. And you can't do that unless you are a member of a particular church. Members are submissive to these leaders and not submissive to other leaders elsewhere. There's also a verse in the New Testament very clearly about supporting your leaders financially that are bringing you the word. Are you to do that for every teacher everywhere? Of course not. You're called to a particular group, Christian leaders to a particular sheep, Christian sheep to particular leaders, all centered around the local church. And thirdly, Christians are told to remove members. Christians are told to remove members. 1 Corinthians 5, several passages, we're just going to look at one. It says, it's actually reported among you there is sexual immorality among you, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Let him who has done this thing be removed from among you. Later in the passage, he says, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge, purge, or get rid of the evil person that is among you? Now, we will likely take an entire sermon on this topic, perhaps next week. But for now, I simply want you to see that Christians are told to remove people from among them at times, which assumes there's something to be removed from. And the way churches have understood this throughout history is not that this man was no longer allowed to come to church, but he was no longer considered a member. He was no longer considered a member of the body there and thus a member of Christ. Uh, that means a lot, what it means to be a member. We'll look at that in the coming weeks. 
The point for this is simply this. You obviously can't expel someone or purge someone or remove someone from something they don't belong to. Uh, Mark Dever said it like this, which I like. He said, if there's no way to be excluded, perhaps you aren't included in the way the Bible intends. If you can't be excluded, then you're probably not included in the way the Bible is talking about when it comes to church membership. Surely, if anyone who walks in the door on a given Sunday is considered part of a church, that doesn't make any sense. So I say all this to say there has been confusion in our particular group about what exactly membership is and if it, it really is a biblical thing. It, it certainly is a biblical thing. We can't make sense of much of what the New Testament is saying if we don't have actual, meaningful membership. All these things you are called to and obligated to, you're obligated to particularly to the members of this church alongside you. There are people in this church, the majority of the folks here are members. There are folks here, though, that are not members. You are not obligated to them in the same way you're obligated to the members, which is one of the reasons I hope that those visiting will become members. You are obligated to members in a particular way called to them in a particular way. These one another passages in a particular way for those who are members alongside. Christians are clearly commanded throughout the Bible to be separate from the world. We're not to forbid relationships with non-Christians, but do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, fellowship, light with darkness, Christ with Belial, all the things it says. And we use this verse primarily to talk about well, at least I did in youth ministry, dating relationships and not dating somebody who's not a Christian. But that's not really what it's about. It's much more about things like church membership, that there is to be a line between those who are Christ and those who are not. It was that way certainly clearly in the Old Testament with Israel and is that way now as well with Christians and with the church. If the church is to display Christ to the world, it will do so by having its members be Christians. Finally, conclusion. Church membership is a blessing. Okay, so church membership is certainly biblical. If all this is on Sunday morning is a group of random people who gets together and happens to make it and who shows up and sings together, then all these one another passages, all these commands about leaders and all these things just fall apart. They don't make any sense. But if membership is something real, then all these passages begin to take on shape. If a church has meaningful membership of committed Christians, everything gets easier Everything becomes more clear. The one and others take shape. The leaders know who they'll give an account for to God. The members know who they must submit to in honor. We all know to whom we are especially called and obligated. The church becomes more than just a group of individuals who show up. And it becomes a single body of many members linked together and covenanted to each other. This is a blessing. This is a beautiful thing. The idea of a community of Christians that do this for each other. What else could you need on earth than these things if we as the church were to do these things well for each other? And membership makes this an actual possibility. Without exception, do you know when marriages are the best? Marriages are the best when each spouse is giving up himself for the sake of the other. And so they are getting very much because the spouse is giving up themselves and they are giving very much. But they go into the marriage not primarily to get, but primarily to give. Church is no different. Churches are the healthiest when the consumer attitude that so dominates our society is thrown in the garbage and says, I'm not going to church primarily to get mine, to make sure I'm entertained, to make sure I'm fill in the blank, but I'm going there to make sure I have the opportunity to fill my brothers, to encourage my sisters, to hold people accountable for the sake of the Lord, knowing they're going to do the same thing for me. Membership like this, actual membership, denies the modern culture of consumerism for the church. So, The bar of what it takes to be a member here at Ohachi has been raised slightly in the past couple of years, what we require for those that are going to be a member. So the likely will be raised more in the future because we want membership to mean something. We we want to be confident when we say you're a member of this church that we believe you're a Christian, that we are affirming you are Christ's. We believe this person belongs to Jesus. We also want to be confident that you are Christ before we take on responsibility as leaders of being accountable to God for you and the congregation being obligated to you in a particular way. And so what's required now currently is simply a a membership interview. And then we introduce you to the church through something that you write for us to get to know you. And likely, again, that will be raised in the future. But the more meaningful membership becomes and is, the healthier a church has the potential of being. The verse you saw at the end of the video, and it's on your 
And that's in part of the bulletin today. Is Ephesians 2, 19 and following. Which says, you are no longer strangers or aliens. The idea is, you're no longer apart from God. And also, you're no longer just an individual. But you are fellow citizens with the saints. Members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And indeed, Christ Jesus himself. Look, if you're a Christian, regardless of your church membership, status. You're a member of the body of Christ, little c, Catholic, at large, worldwide. You are part of Christ. And you've been with him since you died with him and rose with him. You've been welcomed into God's home, welcomed around this table because of his grace, because of your faith. You're identifying with Christ in your baptism. That membership is meant to be displayed and covenanted with a local body of other Christians. If you do Christianity individualized, you deprive yourself and you deprive the church. Christ means for you to have more than just him. When, when, when God told Adam, it's not good for, when God says it's not good for man to be alone, Adam had God. And yet that wasn't totally enough for Adam. God knew already Adam needed more. And so too do you. You need each other. I desperately need you. We are called to live life together. And this idea of real church, members that are accountable to each other and that grow to love each other because of their commitment to know each other well, despite it being often inconvenient, is the pathway that God gives us in the New Testament for your growth, through coming to know Christ more, becoming to glorify him more.